what's the matter with you? Well, Mick, since this is a robot program, I am getting in the mood. Yes, and Sonia is just one of the amazing robots we've got on the show this week. Thank you very much, Gary. Actually, we do have a lot of these creatures this week. We have a robot hand, a robot arm, a robot voice that sings. We've got a small robot called Zero Two, we'll see him later on, dummies that crash in cars, and at last, a homemade Floyd the Droid. But while you were all going robot crazy, I let Mike Sharp out of his den and took him to the personal computer show at Olympia. The first thing you notice about a show like this is the crowds and the noise. You can hardly hear yourself speak. Mike was keen to have a look at the new computers on display, while well, I wanted to get my hands on the software and the new kinds of computer games. This is the new release from British Telecom. It's called MUD. That stands for Multi-User Dungeons. It doesn't look too exciting, does it? But in fact, this is the world's largest text adventure. You can't buy this in the shops because it wouldn't fit in any of today's home computers. You have to play it via a modem and access to a telephone line. So, by dialing up the number on the computer, British Telecom put you in the game. Now, 100 players can play it simultaneously, so there's a good chance that you might bump into your friend who's playing it as well. Now, to play a game like Mud, you need a device like this. It's called a modem. Mike, what hints would you give people about setting out to buy one? Well, first of all, there's the price. Between about 40 and 200 for a home modem, I suppose. Next is what databases you want to talk to, because that will define which baud rates you need in your modem to communicate with those computers. And finally, of course, you will also need to check there's a good terminal mode program for your computer. Now, these are bad news when it comes to the phone bill paying, because they do run off the phone board, don't they? Well, they run up the phone bill as ordinary calls would. You also need to pay logged-on time charges you can get cheap rates and things at weekends, of course. Could be bad news if you're a slow typer. Yeah, could. So, if your phone bill is a few hundred pounds higher, oh no, you've got a modem somewhere. So then, Mike, why have you brought me here? What's so special about this one? What I wanted to show you here, Gary, is the new Research Machines Nimbus, latest in the family of computers from Research Machines, which you've been using in schools for quite a few years now. Now, this actual model, it's a new one. Now, is it in schools already? Um, a few in schools, but not many. This term is the big term for shipping them out to schools. Well, the advantages are the 16-bit processor, which allows it to be much more powerful, much, much quicker. You can connect a lot of them together in a network, and it's a very flexible machine for many, many applications. The software backup is quite good because it runs MS-DOS, which means it runs a lot of commercial packages, which have lots and lots of uses across the school. But this machine is really only going to be small fry in comparison with the next machine we'll be looking at. Well, Gary, this seems to be the computer that's taking the show by storm at the moment, the new 16-bit Atari. So what's so special about this one, Mike? I mean, 16-bits have been around on the market for quite a bit of time now. Well, they have, but what's special about this is two points, really. First thing is, you buy the whole package. You get the computer, the disk drive, and the monitor all in the same package, and you don't have to sort of go around and buy your own television and get your own disk drive and things like that. But more important than that is the software that's available for it already. This is the launch day, and already we've got this much software and the other side of this piece of paper as well, and that's pretty rare. Yeah. Not many computers come out with that much software on the market. So how much is this one, then? Well, this one's about £700. £700 this year, £400 next year, and so on. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's a bit pricey, isn't it, for a 16-bit, because a lot of people haven't got that money to spare and they can just sort of go out and buy an old black and white telly, which will, you know, do them until they've got enough money to buy a monitor. Well, they can, but this is not aimed at the sort of lower end of the market. It's aimed in the middle of the market, people who want to have personal computers as well as all kinds of other bits and pieces, you know, to play games on, to do word processing, database management, things like that at home. So it's up, up market a bit from your sort of lower end computers. So if you've got 700 odd pounds, do you recommend this? If I had 700 pounds to spend, I would think very seriously about this machine, yeah. I see. I'm using the GEM interface on the Atari. 
it allows me to use just about any package which the GEM system supports. And I'm using GEM Draw at the moment, which is just one of the package of the desktop system, rather like the Macintosh. The GEM Draw allows me to pick up shapes and fill them with any pattern that I like. I can choose another pattern, fill that and I could then uh, pick up yet another shape, put it inside, or the same shape and put it inside again. It's just like a desktop system, but a hell of a lot cheaper than the uh, standard Macintosh package at the moment. But I think Gary's been trying one or two other applications for this particular micro. Actually, now I've had time to play with this machine a bit, I find this really interesting game. It's called Graticus. And instead of using a keyboard or a joystick, control this little man here. It uses a device called a mouse. Now, this works by simply, if I move this right, the man on the screen will move right. So you've got quite a bit of control over it. And if I press these two buttons here, and move it forward, he draws a sword to fight. Let's hope more games like this appear for the computers. What a great show. I hated to see it end. Of course, it would have gone right over Mick and Sonia's heads. They don't really appreciate what computers can do. They just keep saying, oh, they'll never replace people. Hey, I must say I've never used a robot arm to pick up an egg before, apart from the old uh, toasted soldiers at me breakfast. Well, Gary didn't say we had to eat them. He just said we couldn't pick them up with this robot arm as well as a computer could. Yeah, well, this is a, this is a doddle, actually, if you really know what you're up to. Yeah, but you don't, so hold the egg properly. Right, just pick it in the old grip bar. No, the egg, the egg. That's a nice technique, technique. Right, watch this, ready? Make you holding the egg. Egg! God, I always end up picking up the pieces <coughs> after you two. Look, why don't you two just lay off and let the micro do the work? Get it? Lay off. <laughs> This is doing all the work now, is it? Mm-hmm. Bet it drops here. Computers will never replace people, but they can be programmed to perform very delicate operations like this far better than we can. Watch this. I'll catch it. It's gonna drop it. I'll catch it. Let them work. Huh? Got a good name for this machine. Jack. <laughs> Jack, Jack the Gripper. <laughs> This robot arm was made for educational use, but it can also work the same way an industrial arm works. It's, you can either tell it which joint to move or how far, it'll be okay. Or you can just simply punch in the coordinates on the computer and the robot will go there of its own accord. Yeah, listen, next time you program it, though, when I have a go, make sure it's programmed to boil the egg first. Now, sometimes these artificial hands and arms need to look lifelike as well as act it. So here it is, the hand of the future. And it's uh, very simply operated as far as I'm concerned. You've got a band across this arm here and uh, underneath connects up to two major muscles in this arm. And uh, with all this electronic wizardry here, it's connected to this hand. Now, basically, very simple, I pull my hand back and this one opens and the opposite direction and it closes. So let's have a go at picking something up. This piece of foam rubber, open, like that, and... And there it is. And apparently this has become so successful, some people who unfortunately have lost a hand in an accident are now being fitted with this device. Quite good, eh? You start with this metal skeleton. It has what they call an intelligent finger, one with a sensor built in. The outer covering is made of a lifelike synthetic material. The electrodes in this armband receive signals from the muscles. Then they send instructions back to the artificial hand via a separate microprocessor. The microprocessor monitors all the movements and pressure so that if this pencil is slipping, the hand will grip it tighter. Now, what do you suppose a really intelligent hand would write? This little space age creature is called Zero Two, see it waving here, and it's brought along a slightly larger friend called Richard. Now Richard told me that Zero has lights, a pen holder, and a line follower. Now I'm very impressed by all this, but what does it actually do? Well it's really for robotics experiments, mucking around, 
fixing things to it, perhaps with string, sellotape or a screwdriver, whatever you can. On the other hand, with software, it could teach maths, it could uh, water the plants, it could rock the baby, uh, it could do dressmaking patterns. There's all sorts of things it could be programmed to do. Right. Well, I don't have a baby and I don't make my own dresses and my mother waters the plants, so how can it actually help me? I mean, I'm at school. Can it help me with things like revision? Well, that's pretty difficult, but um, do you do music? Well, I did, yeah. Oh, well, let me show you something. Come on, zero two. Here we go. Keyboard. I see Paul Harcourt are having any sleepless nights over it now. Hey, Gary, you really have got to draw the line somewhere, you know. Oh, these robots can't make jokes yet. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm working on it. Now, in the meantime, we've got something that's almost like a robot that sings. It's called Votrax. And it's a talking computer, and it's made up of video and chip song for us. But, unfortunately, halfway through, he seems to have lost his drive. Get it? His drive. Anyway, this week's contest is to finish off the song for him, and the winners will get hold of this bunch of goodies. A little Move It robot kit and one of these books about robots. Great stuff. Now, we'll show you the words of the song while Votrax is singing, so just watch the song and then make up, say, four, five or six lines more to finish it off. And you can phone it through on our exclusive uh, British Telecom voice bank hotline a bit later on. We'll give you that number after the song. OK, Mick, press the button. OK, here we go. Video and chips. Video and chips. Video and chips. Video and chips. Where are us? These three from the clips. Video and chips. And the electronic clips. Now we're feeling a great. Go round and round. And we sing to you. Our feeling of sound. But our memory is short, so our life is wrong. And we need more words to finish our song. We'll play the song again at the very end of the show, so don't panic. And here's the hotline number. Oh, one, seven, two, five. 9,000 or 01725 9,001. Oh dear, oh dear. I, I think, think I've caught, caught the robot, robot bug. Mike, Mike stop, stop me talking talk. like this. Thank you very much. Here we are into Mike's place, and uh, Mike, what you got for us this week? The electronic combination lock, Mick. Fit on your door, and here we have a door. <laughs> Right, now this, this would obviously be a cupboard door, not a, a front door or a bedroom That's right, door. a cupboard door to keep all your sort of secret things in. OK. There's the door, and round the back, we have all the clever bits. Right, let me put it to the test first, make sure this is, in fact, locked. Yep. Yep, pretty strong. Now, I'll find the combination, if I can remember it. I think it's that one. Try now. So this should now open? Yep. Voila. Very good. No trouble at all. Now, how do you put this together? Because looking at the gubbins behind here looks very complicated. Well, it's actually very simple because all it is is a whole string of switches all connected together, some of which make the circuit and some of which break it. And I've got the upside down picture here. So there are nine switches, 512 possible combinations. So you can actually change them over every day or something? That's right. You? Just by moving the switches, you can change the combination. And so all you need really is a box to put the switches in, the switches, some wire, a little electric motor to actually operate the lock mm. and a battery. It's as simple as that. And how much would uh, this little lock cost to put together? About a five pounds worth, something like that. Great. Bits and pieces. All right then. So then, if you want to use one of these to lock up those secret diaries of yours, write in for our fact pack. But remember, 
to send one of these. This is an A4 envelope, just like this, with your name and a 24-piece stamp on it. Please don't forget the stamp. And write to this address. It's Video and Chips, PO Box 60, Bristol BS 99 7NS. And, of course, the address is in this week's TV Times. What are you going to be doing next week for the last programme? Winkies. Pardon? Electronic jewellery. Oh, right. Well, next week we'll be looking forward to seeing Mike's winkies. Now, if your idea of a dummy is something that stands around in a shop window doing absolutely nothing, then just take a look at this. Here at the Transport and Road Research Laboratory, there's a new dummy in the family. It's full of electronics and it costs over £30,000. The abdomen has a plastic cover that simulates flesh and inside is an electronic switch that's fired if the impact of a crash reaches a certain force. There isn't a brain inside this head, but there is a tiny instrument designed to measure the force of the acceleration in a collision. The dummy we're looking at measures side impact his chest has three large ribs, and across each rib is a cylinder that records sideways impact using reflectors and photocells. Here's another look at all the instruments inside that dummy at work. But the people who walk outside the cars are at as great a risk as those inside. This is another factor tested by the laboratory. All these tests establish basic safety standards. I asked one of the researchers, what are all these standards for? Well, the standards are there for manufacturers to design new cars too, with the aim of making them a lot safer to pedestrians in the future. The car in this slow motion film is moving at 15 miles per hour. Here's what happens when it hits a stationary pedestrian. After seeing the punishment these dummies take on our behalf, all I can say is, keep up the good work. Now then, more and more kids are getting interested in robots as toys and also using them in schools. So to encourage this interest, BP Oil has sponsored a competition challenging schools in Britain to get their groups together to build their own robots. Now then, we've got Daniel, Jacqueline and Marilyn here, and they're just three of a group that were joint winners of the Midlands region, and this is their invention. And, uh, it doesn't really look like a robot to me, gang. What's it all about, Daniel? Well, it's a computer that's designed to help the disabled, but it isn't actually a computer because it can think for itself. Brilliant. Did you do any research into this before you did that? Well, we did research into looking into the future and to see what we'd build it out of, and we tried to make, make it as cheap as possible. Yeah. Did but you get anyone in to talk about it, though? We brought in a disabled woman who was actually disabled. She was crippled in the legs. Yeah. She couldn't walk and she thought it was very good and she especially liked the door because she had difficulty opening the door. So, oh, so you, the door opens itself? Yes. Can we see that? Jacqueline, you've got the, yes. uh, the gizmo over there. Can we see it open? Absolutely brilliant. Mm. Right, Marilyn, one for you then. One thing of a morning when you get up and you've got to go downstairs and get the, the, uh, the letters and that from the postman, have you taken that into consideration? Yeah, well, if the postman posts the letters through the... Through this here? Yeah. Knocks the switch there yep. and sends the letter on a conveyor belt to a platform by a bed, and then she can get a letter. Right, does that work, Jacqueline? Yes. The switch. Look at this. I'll take it that this will be covered by some kind yes. of uh, mm. some covers, yes. yeah, to, yeah. Keep it all looking smart. That's absolutely brilliant. Right then, Jacqueline, how about, say, heating and ventilation? Got anything for that? Yes, there is a heater here, which. This here? Um, yes, that right. you can turn that on from the bedside as well. Can you do that? Yes, like that. Brilliant. And when it gets too hot, the window opens. <laughs> you thought of everything. Now, I'll talk to uh, Daniel about this one, girls, if you don't mind. In the kitchen. I don't know about you, but I hate washing up and doing the washing. What, have you done anything there? Well, we did the washing line, which was taking out the washing when it's dry outside and bringing it in when it's wet. Yeah? So, yes. so what, you hang it up inside. Yes. This is it here, yeah? Yes. And. Out it goes, it gets dried, and if it starts raining, it'll automatically yes. come back in. 
Brilliant. Lighting? Anything with lighting, Jacqueline? Yes, there is a little sensor down here, mm -hmm. an LDR. An LDR? What's that mean? That means light-dependent resistor. Right. And so when it gets covered, the lights will go on. So cover it up. And look at this. <laughs> Brilliant. How many were actually in the group? Was it, did I say 19? 19 were in the group. That was the whole class. Right, okay. And uh, this here, just an ordinary, what, blind or something? Yes, yes oh. it's a blind. And that and works as well? Yes, so it goes up. There's also another LDR, mm -hmm. and that goes, and when you cover it, it goes down. But it's light, and so it's going up. Great. And uh, so all of you got together then, you all threw your ideas in, and this is what you came up with. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Underneath the carpet, I take it, looking back, is all the uh, the wires and the gubbins, yeah? Yes. All the clever yeah. stuff, and it's covered up lovely with uh, carpet for the living room and lino in this room here. Well, I think you've all done a really good job with that. I think the final for this is, what, in, in October? Yes. yes. Right, mm. and, and whereabouts is that going to take place? In Arborfield. Arbor Arbor Arborfield in Reading, eh? Yes. Well, good luck with all that. I'm sure that you're going to absolutely scoop all the honours with this because it's absolutely brilliant. Well done. Did, did you hear that noise? Oh, yes. Mm. What um, is what it? It's actually the sound of Floyd the droid. I thought he'd be back somewhere. Floyd, where are you? If you can remember back to the last series of video and chips, I built my robot Floyd the droid and sent out instructions to hundreds of you who wanted to build one yourselves. One of those people was Philip Boydell from Sheffield, who's built a little Floyd's cousin. So, you got hold of the fact pack and off you go. Where, where'd you go from there? Well, I started collecting the bits and bobs from around the home. I see. Things, uh, the motor under here doesn't look like the one I recommended. What's, uh, what's exactly that? Well, that's a big track motor uh, to the toy. Ah, I see. Well, that's quite clever. And it's got some lights. What, uh, what are they all about? Well, when one motor's on, one set of lights are on, the other, another set of lights on. Oh, I see. And over here... What's, what's this little... Oh! That has, has to be inserted, else the robot won't run it, stop other people from using it. All it does is joins up the circuit inside. So it's a clever key? Yeah. Mm. And it connects back to the computer, which is just here. And this is a standard spectrum, by the yes. looks of it. Nothing too technical. The box at the back, though, that doesn't look standard at all. No, that's an interface which turn, basically just turns the motors on and off inside the robot, enabling it to turn left and left and right. Did you buy that or build no? It? I made that. You made it. Yes. I see. Difficult? Um, not too difficult. What about cost of it? Uh, altogether, it costs about twenty-five pounds. Interface and the robot. Yes. Did you all by yourself? Well, I just needed a little help with the programming. Then. Well, that's great, Philip. Thanks a lot. Floyd, say goodbye to your cousin. Well, that's all we've got time for now. See you next week. We'll have Chris Bonington in the studio to show us a computer he took 22,000 feet up Mount Everest. And we'll have the best sound effects produced for our ghost story by one of you on your synthesizer. Yeah, what about this week's uh, song competition? I thought I might want to have a go at that myself. <laughs> You've got absolutely no chance. Anyway, we'll repeat the song in just a moment and phone in your entry. Call the hotline as soon as the program's over. So, play, play it again, Voltrex.